Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to continue with our message regarding David, our study of David. I know we're getting into the holiday season, and, and we'll probably have a few Advent messages coming up. But, hey, he was born of the son of David, right? So this is kind of a Christmas message when it comes down to it. <laughs> um, we've got to tie together several passages of Scripture this morning. Uh, as with David's uh, extensive history, we're covering, we've had to cover a lot of ground. And really, we're, we're going to be in chapter 29 and chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. So you can find your place there, but I will tell you that we are going to be flipping around to a few other chapters there, primarily in 1 Samuel. Because this is a point of, of where several of David's decisions came to a head. And we're going to find where uh, some of those decisions uh, led to situations that were not ideal. But as you saw, and as Paul had men made mention of the Facebook post, maybe you have been in an awkward situation before. Maybe you've been in a situation that was less than ideal. Maybe even a situation that you know is wrong. Maybe you've been in a situation that you know is sinful. Maybe that situation is through uh, no fault of your own or no circumstance of your own. Maybe you were born into a family that uh, struggled with certain sins or certain habits or certain uh, addictions that, that made life difficult. Perhaps you were in a car accident or someone had an accident with you and, and there are consequences to that. But perhaps... You have been in a situation like I have been in where you are in a tough spot because of decisions that you have made, decisions that you have made. Sometimes those decisions were made before you knew the Lord. Sometimes those decisions were made after you knew the Lord. But you're in a situation that is just, it's just not the best. And David found himself in a situation just like that. And we're going to look at that this morning together. C.H. Uh, McIntosh, and I'd just like to read a paragraph, a, a short paragraph that he said regarding this uh, particular passage in the situation. And he, and he makes it very applicable to us because we look into the Old Testament and we see all these stories and these accounts and like, you know, that's great. And we see the genealogies and, and it all kind of worked out. But what does that matter to us right now, 2024 Christmas season. Well, listen to what C.H. McIntosh wrote in the 1800s. God forbid that we should make any other use of what we may uh, term the zigzag portion of David's history. That's what we're going to look at here today. Save to apply it to our own hearts before God and use it as a matter of solemn and soul-searching warning. For though it may, may be said that there is a wide difference between the standing and privileges of David and those of the church of God now, yet in every age and dispensation, nature is the same. And we seriously wrong our own souls if we fail to learn a wholesome lesson from the falls of one so high up in the school of Christ as David. Dispensations differ, no doubt, in their great leading features. But there is a wonderful analogy in God's principles of discipline at all times. Let the standing of his people differ as it may. And so there is application for us this morning. I'd like to just read a couple of portions of scripture, and then we're going to ask the Lord to bless our time this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 29 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 29 verse 1 says, Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, while the Israelites were camping by the spring which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines were proceeding on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were proceeding on in the rear with Achish. That's the king of Gath, the king of the Philistines. Then the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days, or rather these years? And I have found no fault in him from the day... He des uh, deserted to me to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him 
And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Make the man go back, that he may return to his place where you have assigned him, and do not let him go down to battle with us, or in the battle he may become an adversary to us. For with what could this man make himself acceptable to the Lord, to his Lord, would it not be the heads of these men? Is this not David of whom they sing in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now, we have intentionally picked up right in the middle of a, a larger context, and we're going to look at that context here in just a minute. Our Father, we come to you now. We pray that you would give us wisdom as we look into this portion of Scripture. There's a lot for us to unpack and to unfold here, but you have recorded it intentionally for our benefit. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand what is going on here so that we might walk closer with the Lord Jesus this morning. And we pray this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So, one might ask, why in the world was David going out to fight with the Philistines? And why in the world was the king of the Philistines so in love with David? He's like, man, this guy, he's all right. Well, let's figure this out. So this actually goes back a few chapters, but this is not the first time that David has gone to the Philistines, ironically enough. If you go back to chapter 21 of 1 Samuel, and we'll build ourselves back up to chapter 29 here and chapter 30 here in just a moment, but back in chapter 21, David was on the run from Saul. You remember that David has been anointed king of Israel. He is the anointed king of Israel by uh, Samuel's hand, but Saul is still the acting king. And just like in the world we live today, today, we were told that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We know that the Lord Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. He's just not recognized as such right now. But we know who the true king is. And Saul was still going through tremendous turmoil in his own heart, in his own life. And on more than one occasion, he tried to kill David. And so David was on the run for his life. And back in chapter 21... Verse 10, it says, Then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva run down into his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I like madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? In other words, I got enough crazy people around. I don't need another one. So you see that David went to the king of Achish, curiously enough, and the servants of Achish said the same thing they said about him, Later on, we'll get to it in just a minute in chapter 29, said this is David, the one who killed our champion. He killed Goliath. Why do you think he's here? He's a double agent. He's a spy. And they would have nothing to do with it. And David took this to heart, and his response here in chapter 21 is actually far different than it was over in chapter 29, as we find. David acted absolutely loony. He acted like a lunatic. He drooled in his beard. He scribbled on the walls just like the guy that you see in the Gospels that was uh, possessed with many demons and he was going around, running around in the tombs and so forth. And so he acts crazy and the Lord used that um, situation to actually deliver him from the king of Achish in that moment. David, because of that situation, that encounter, wrote my favorite psalm, Psalm 34. And there's, he says, this poor man cried unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered him out of all his troubles. Even David acting the fool, God used that to deliver him from the king of Achish. So you would think that David would have learned his lesson from that encounter. But no, unfortunately he did not. Flip forward again to chapter 27. <clears throat> chapter 27, this... Uh, follows after David had again spared Saul's life. Saul is in hot pursuit of David. He wants to kill David, and Saul uh, 
is again spared by David's hand. David said, I'm not going to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And he did the right thing in that situation. But then in chapter 27, verse 1, look at what David says. David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me uh, anymore in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. Now again, that's a curious conclusion that David made right there. David's conclusion after witnessing God deliver him from the king of Achish, witnessing God deliver him from the hand of Saul more than once, multiple times, having uh, Saul. I don't think Saul was a bad shot with the spear, by the way. I think he was pretty skilled at throwing the spear. I think that God intentionally spared David from when Saul hurled the spear at David. So on multiple occasions, God had proven to him that he could take care of David. David himself's own testimony to Saul before he killed Goliath was that, you know, I was out in the field by myself. And God delivered the hand of the, uh, the, uh, the, the paw of the bear and the lion, and et cetera, et cetera. And yet in this moment, he says, there's nothing better for me to do than to go to the world. And I have nothing better circled in my Bible there. How did he come to this conclusion? I, I don't know. I don't know what was going through David's mind when he came to this conclusion. But I can tell you that there is always, that, that going to the world is never the right choice for the believer. Going to the world is never the right choice. If you read on in this passage here in chapter 27, you find that he and his 600 men in verse 2 went to the king of Achish. And here he lived there with the king in verse 3. And he actually mentions his family. His family put down roots there in verse four, uh, 3. Talked about his two wives that went with him. And interestingly enough, Saul says, okay, well, he's gone to Gath. He's deserted me, and I'm not, I'm not going to follow after him anymore. So in one sense, it was uh, a successful uh, journey there, uh, walking away from, from Saul. But notice here in verse 7. The number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now, those of you who like numerology in the Bible, that's 16 months, right? That's four times four. Four is the number of the world. And so for 16 months, four times four, he was in the world. And we don't know all that went on in that time, but we know that he wasn't among the Lord's people. We do know some of the things that went on. He was a liar during that time. If you read on in uh, verses 8 through 12, you find that David and his men were a special ops group for the king of Achish. They were actually, they would go out on missions and they would go and they would destroy cities and they would kill the inhabitants of those cities. Actually, they said that they were going to attack the, the cities of Israel and cities of Judah, but actually they were not. They came back and they lied to the king of Achish. They said, oh yeah, we, we attacked the south of Judah. But they were actually attacking some of the Canaanites and some of the others. And so he was lying to the king of Achish. But the king of Achish believed him. Verse 12 says, So Achish believed David, saying, He has surely made himself odious among the people of Israel. Therefore he will become my servant forever. You see, Achish fell for David lock, stock, and barrel. He thought, this guy has really deserted the people of God. He has deserted Israel. He has thrown in his lot with the Philistines. That's what the king of Achish thought. And I think that uh, he was sincere in that, in that belief. So much so that chapter 28, verse, the first couple of verses says, Now it came about in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies uh, to camp for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Know assuredly that you will go out with me in the camp, you and your men. David said to Achish, Very well, you shall know what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Or you will guard my head, I believe the King James says. Let me just tell you, you don't entrust your head to somebody you don't trust. And so Achish was all in on this David fellow. The anointed king of Israel, 
And here he is guarding the head of the enemy of the Lord. Wow, what an interesting situation. Also notice there that verse that we read, know assuredly what your servant can do. That sounds very prideful to me. Now, we don't know how he said that, but it sounds like David, rather than going out into the valley of Elah saying, I don't come to you with a sword or a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord my God, sounds like David says, you know, I can, I can do some stuff myself now. Watch this. You know, hold my spear. And so here we have this David with, it appears to be some pride in his heart and, and some arrogance and some self-sufficiency that, you know what, I can dabble in the world, I can be friends with the king of Achish, I can guard his head and still be the anointed king of Israel. Now, again, we don't know all that was going on in David's heart at this time. But it is my conclusion about this passage as we get back to chapter 29. If you want to turn back there, we'll begin our, our, our look into that here in just a second. But it is my conclusion that this was a path that was not ideal for David. This path, as I mentioned in our opening thoughts, was a situation that sometimes we find ourselves in. That's just not the best. Sometimes of our own doing, sometimes of our not not our own doing. And so David is going along this path, and God is still using him. Actually, the enemies that he was fighting while he was pretending to fight Judah there, and he was running missions for Achish, God wanted those people to be taken care of as well. So he was, God was still using David, but I don't think he used David like he wanted to use him. You don't see David there in the cave of Adullam teaching his men to wait upon the Lord. You don't see David there trusting the Lord in the midst of, of, of uh, moments where uh, he could take Saul's life. You don't see David's conscience bothering him just because he cut off the robe of Saul, the, the edge of robe, uh, Saul's robe. And so you see that he was a little bit dull, I believe, to the leading of God. And so we too have those moments in our life, the life of faith. There's a series of falls and restorations, Macintosh would say in another place, displaying on one hand the sad weakness of man and the, on the other the grace and power of God. So we ask ourselves, okay, well, we're in these situations that are not ideal. David is in this situation. How is God going to deliver him from this? Well, after 16 months of playing in the world, God had to get David's attention. And here's how he's going to do it. So, chapter 29, we read that passage there, the first five verses. They were going out to battle. The Philistines were about to go out to battle against the Israelites. Now, someone might ask, what was David going to do when they went into battle? I don't know. Was he going to fight the Israelites? Was he going to, as the captains of the Philistines thought he might, turn and fight against the Philistines? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> David probably didn't know. I don't know. But the, the, the fact of the matter was he was in an awkward situation. He was in a tough situation. And sometimes we're in those situations and we don't know what to do. David might not have known what to do. And so Achish calls in verse 6 of chapter 29, picking up there, Achish, Achish called to David, that's the king of the Philistine, and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out, and you're coming in with me in the armies, uh, uh, and you're pleasing in my sight. For I have not found evil in you from the day you're coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, you are not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Now, that statement in and of itself was not true. David had been lying to Achish. He was not upright in all of his dealings. So he was even deceiving that king. But he had effectively won over the heart of Achish. And Achish tells him in verse 7, return and go in peace. Isn't it interesting how God sometimes delivers us from our own problems? Now, who would have thought that the king would have just said, go on back. Don't even bother yourself. Now David didn't have to make a decision. He didn't have to make a decision about whether or not to fight the Philistines or fight the Israelites or pretend to fight the Israelites. God was giving him an out. 
That's the mercy of God, by the way. Verse 7 there, that is God delivering his people from their own problems. Just like in chapter 21 and in Psalm 34, God delivered David from that situation where he shouldn't have been in by him acting the fool and acting crazy. God here uses this king of the Philistines to deliver David from a problem that he had created. Verse 8 is, is so curious to me. David says, what have I done and what have you found in your servant from the day when I came before you to this day that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? What was going through David's mind? I don't know. I really don't. But I believe, again, that that 16 months in the world had dulled David's conscience. I believe that. Again, I don't know all that he went through. I don't know all he was thinking. I don't know his plan. But I know this, that you cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the things of God and expect to come out a righteous person. You cannot play with sin and expect to be a choice vessel for the Lord. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, you need to cleanse yourselves of those worldly um, influences. It says, flee youthful lust so that you can be a vessel fit for use for the master's, uh, for, for uh, an honorable vessel fit for the master's use. Our conscience can be dulled. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. The things that we know to be right can be blurred by our senses being desensitized by the things of the world. The devil owns the fence, as we've talked about. My mom would say something like this. She would say that the price of sin in our lives should not be measured by our ability to handle the consequences. You know, sometimes we like to just touch the fire, right? Oh, well, that didn't, that didn't hurt. Well, I'll touch it a little bit more. And by the end of the, the trial, our hands burned off because we just thought we could touch the fire a little bit more, a little bit more. And we thought, I can handle just a little bit of sin. I can handle a little bit of the world's influence. And then 16 months later, we are still caught in the world. We are still dull to the leading of God. And we are going out to battle against the Lord's people. And so David finds himself in a bad situation. A situation that I think that we might be able to relate to. And God help us to be delivered from these struggles that we face in, in our lives. And so you can read on through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> David and his 600 men, they go back to the place called Ziklag. By the way, Ziklag was a city that Achish had given to David. Anything that the world gives you is probably not going to work out that well. And so the city that had been given to David by the world, they go back to it and they find a horrible, horrible sight. Read with me the first six verses of chapter 30. Again, David, having been caught in this trap for over a year, happened when David, verse 1, and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Am uh, Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Prescott had the opportunity to share the word a few months ago and he had some thoughts on this very passage and I've got some of them written down here so I'm going to use some of that. Things came to a screeching halt for David in this moment. He'd been playing in the world. 
You think God got his attention now? He comes back to his place where he had established a nice home. His wives were there. They were comfortable. His sons, his daughters, his friends' wives and sons and daughters were there. This was home. They were going out to battle. But they got turned back. They got sent home. So they're going home to rest, relax, whatever the case may be. And they come home and they find the city has been completely ransacked. Their homes have been burned. Their cattle has been taken. Their stuff has been either taken or destroyed. Their wives have been taken. Their sons, their daughters, their entire families have been taken. And here are 601 brave men who have followed David for all their heart, with all their heart. They went to him because they didn't have anybody else to turn to. And they followed him, and now everything has come apart. You know, sometimes God has to take away all that stuff to get our attention. God, David was listening now. <laughs> he was listening because he didn't have anybody else to talk to. He didn't have anybody else that he could commiserate with. Matter of fact, his best friends that would lay down their life for him was about to lay down his life for them. And here it comes back in this place. The, the desolation, the raising of this place. We read here in verse 4, there was no strength in them to weep. That's pretty destitute. That's pretty sad. That's pretty bottom of the barrel. You can't even produce the tears to be sad. And here he is. His wives taken. His personal wives. And it says that he was greatly distressed. Do you think? He was in a strait, as we've talked about here recently. And that last part of verse 6 says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's the first time you hear him talk about the Lord, I would suggest, in about 16 months. Because God finally got his attention and said, Hey, you are the king of Israel. You are not to be in the land of the Philistines. You are my chosen vessel. Through you will come the Savior of the world. You don't need to be messing around with the king of Achish. Do I have your attention now? And so here he is in this place of absolute weakness, of absolute dependence, of absolute necessity, and he turns to the Lord. He does what a faithful man does, and he turns back to the Lord. The Proverbs tells us that the righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You know, our life is not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make the wrong decisions every once in a while. But you know what? The difference is if we turn back to the Lord, if we repent and come to the Lord and say, you know what, I messed up. But Lord, can you take my failure, my brokenness, and can you do something great from this? And we're going to find out that that's exactly what David does. For sake of time, we're not going to read the entire passage here in chapter 30, but we are going to hit the highlights. So David, after first of all, by the way, this is the first step. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Sometimes we just need to go to the Lord. We just need to be with the Lord. Sometimes we need to fast. Sometimes we need to just go away from everybody else. We need to maybe sometimes even literally get down on our knees before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm in a problem situation. I'm, 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 I've got some problems. <laughs> I'm in a situation that I can't get out of by myself. I've been doing it myself for the last 16 months or 16 years or whatever the case may be, and I need your help. And so he came to them. Our brother Prescott reminded us that when we are weak, then we are strong out of 2 Corinthians. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, in verse 7, Please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And what he's going to do here in the next verse, he says, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. I don't remember him taking that ephod up and asking if he should go to the king of Achish. I don't remember him asking if he should go to the land of the Philistines to escape Saul. But now he is. He's asking, Hey, Lord, I need your help. I need your direction. Isn't it great 
that we have a great high priest who can sympathize with us, that we don't have to go to Abiathar the priest. We don't have to go get the Urim or the Thummim or the Ephod or whatever they use there in the Old Testament to inquire of the Lord. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we can go to Him with our praise, with our pleas, with our, with our needs. In whatever situation we find ourselves in, we can go to Him. And He asked the Lord. He says, you know what? I'm not going to do this on my own. I'm going to ask the Lord what I need to do. And, da- and, and the Lord gives David clear direction. Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. And so as you read on through this passage, they run across an Egyptian. Verse 11, they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate and they provided him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins, etc. And it find, we find out that this particular Egyptian, as you read on through verse 15, he was actually a servant. He was a slave to the Amalekites there. And when he became sick, and he could no longer perform for them, they just left him to die. I believe that's a picture of the world again. You know, the world may pretend to be your friend. The world may pretend to need you. But as soon as you are of no use to them, they let you die. By the way, the devil doesn't like you. Satan doesn't like you. He doesn't care about you. He will give you the faint uh, the faintness of being happy. He will give you the faintness of having a quote unquote fulfilled life. But his one objective is to make sure that you do not have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. He does not want you to have the abundant life that Jesus Christ wants for you. He may give you the the devil can make you happy with money, with the stuff of this world. All of it is fake. He hates you. He hates the Lord. He does not want the best for you. And so when we give ourselves over to the pleasures of this world, to the things that the world can offer, we are playing into the devil's hand. And as soon as our life is over, we will be left to die, just like this Egyptian. But this Egyptian found someone who was actually interested in him and helped him in this moment and gave him uh, a compassionate hand in this moment. We find that this Egyptian told him of where the uh, Amalekites had taken the people of Israel, the the, the wives of David and the other 600 men, and he told them where uh, they were. And so they pursued the the band here that had taken (coughs) David and his men's uh, stuff, and they go and they, uh, and they, Slaughter them all and there in verses 16 through 20. They deliver, they deliver these people back into their own hands. We find out uh, also uh, in the last part of, of chapter 30, verse 21, David came to the 200 men. Oh, by the way, so the 600 men, yeah, I meant to mention this. The 600 men were pursuing. They found this Egyptian. They found out where they were. But there were 200, a third of them, that were too exhausted to pursue uh, after the, the enemies, the Amalekites. And so we're told that there were 200 that stayed by the baggage. They stayed by the stuff. They kept the, the, the guard there. And so 400 men with David went and they, they slaughtered the Amalekites. They delivered uh, Abigail and, and uh, uh, Hinnom and the rest of the wives and children, et cetera, et cetera. And they brought them back. And the 400 maybe even rightfully so, said, you know, we're the ones that actually went across the river, and we're the ones that actually did the work, and so when we get back, we think that we should have the spoils, and these other guys should not. And so when you kick up there in verse 21, it says, when David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, who had also been left at the brook Besor, they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him, then they approached the people and, and greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men among those who went with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man his wife and to his children. In other words, you can have, you can have your family, but none of the other stuff you can have. But they may lead them away and depart. And then David said, You must not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us, 
who has kept us and delivered us into the, our, uh, our hand, the band that came against us, and who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. In other words, we're all a team here. There's a parable that the Lord Jesus told. There was a vine grower, a, a, a vineyard owner, and he needed someone to work in his field. And so he went out and he found someone to work in his field in the very first part of the morning. And so he was working. And then he found some others and he sent them out about what was the, the 11th hour or the, uh, the, the 6th hour and the 8th hour, 11th hour. I don't remember the exact numbers. But finally in the 11th hour, they only had one hour to work before the day was done. And they all worked in the field and they came at the end of the day to get their wages. And the one who had only worked one hour got the same wage as the one who had worked the entire day. Now, those who had worked the entire day thought, man, I've got more hours. I've got more billable hours here. I should get more for the day because I had to work through the sun and I worked through lunch and all of this. And the parable, the, the master said, it's my money to give to I want. And he says, I agreed to pay you this. And I agreed to pay this person this. It happens to be the same. And he says, your eye is envious because I am generous. You see, don't miss that point of the whole parable, that the Lord is eager to reward anything done for him. We're told that if you give a cup of water in the name of the Lord Jesus, that will not go unnoticed by the Lord. There is another parable that says, or another passage that says, that he who greets a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So when we have a missionary come through and we pray for them or maybe support them financially and encourage them, the Lord in heaven, in his tables, in his accounting, he will give us a reward for sharing in the work in Tanzania or wherever it is. That is an incredibly generous God that we serve. One who is willing to share all that he has with all of his children. You see, sometimes when we're, uh, whether it's an employer or with our children or, or whatever the case, sometimes we're being very careful to divvy up our stuff because we have limited resources. Like, okay, well, he worked for this amount of time, so I'm going to give him. He's older or whatever the case may be. That's not, with the, that's not the case with the Lord. The Lord has an infinite amount of grace, an infinite amount of goodness, and He is looking for ways to share it with each one of us. It's not that He's standing there like Ebenezer Scrooge just trying to give out as little as He can. No, He is willing to give as much as possible. It was A.W. Tozer who said, though, that He will not embarrass us with the riches that we do not want. And so here we have David bringing back this word uh, to the people that stayed by uh, the baggage, those that had stayed back who were too exhausted. He said, no, everyone will share the same in this bounty. And, and notice also that he's calling upon the name of the Lord. Verse 23, you must not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. Now, in the last chapter, we read that uh, he told Achish, he said, you'll see what I can do. But now he's saying, you've seen what the Lord has done. His whole mindset has shifted now because he has been brought back to the place of, of submission to God's will. And so, as the, as the chapter uh, ends... <clears throat> He comes back in verse 26. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Behold, a gift for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to those who were in Bethel and to those who were in Ramoth of the Negev and to those who were in Jatir and those who were in Aurora and those who were in Sipmoth and those who were in Eshtimoah and to those who were in Rachel and those who were in the cities of uh, ooh, Jeremelites, and to those who were in the cities of the Kenites, and to those who were in the Horma, and to those who were in Bor Ashan, and to those who were in Atach, and those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to go. Now, why did I struggle through those names? 
because he's now thinking about the people of God. No longer is he going to battle with the king of Achish. No longer is he deceiving the king of Achish and fighting for the Philistines and deceiving. Now he said, look, this is what God has given me. And he sends it to all the places of Israel where he would soon be king. And he says, this is what the Lord has given us. So all of this, I, I, I can appreciate that this was a lot of volume of material here this morning. But it does do us good to get the whole picture here. That David went through what we might even call a, a, a moment of a valley. A valley of poor decisions. A valley of maybe not pursuing God the way he should have pursued him. And God in his sovereignty, God in his grace, orchestrated that the circumstances bring David right back to the place of serving the people of God. That's what the king's supposed to do, right? That's what God wanted for David to serve and to honor and to, and to, and to lead his people Israel. And so, just like David went through this moment of, of need, of poor decision, of perhaps quenching his conscience, God was able to bring David back to this place of dependence, to where he would say, no longer, let me show you what I can do, but let me show you what the Lord has done. And so my encouragement for us each one today is that God absolutely has a place for us. God absolutely has a reward for us. But it behooves us to walk carefully. The scripture would tell us in the New Testament, do not walk as unwise men, walk as wise men, walk in the light. It says expose the deeds of darkness. How do you expose the deeds of darkness? By walking in the light. And so just like David struggled with these matters, we too will struggle. We too will face opposition. We will too will face decisions, maybe of our own doing, maybe not. But God wants to bring us to that place of absolute dependence. So I would encourage you, if you're going through a valley of, of struggle, if you're going through a valley of need, turn to the Lord. Seek the Lord. You don't need anyone else to do that. He is available to call upon the name of the Lord to whosoever. If you've not put your trust in the Lord Jesus, Today is the day. If you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus, enjoy the bounty that God has made available to you. Our Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for David. I'm thankful for the testimony that he bears to us. We can relate to struggling in our moments of weakness. We can relate to sometimes making the wrong decisions. But Father, we can also relate to the grace of God that is able to preserve us and help us through each moment. I pray that you would lead us and guide us even as we face our own uh, decisions and the, the situations of our own life, I'm thankful that you are not hindered. Your arm is not so short that it cannot save. There is no circumstance that baffles you. There is no place that we can go that you are just overwhelmed. And I'm thankful, Father, that the Lord Jesus has taken out the biggest hindrance, that is our sin, and now we can walk and worship in freeness and newness of life. I thank you for this opportunity to look into your word and just pray that you would lead us now from this place. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, amen.